possibly even the animals you keep as pets per se breed those and feed them to the other animals you have so like i have crested gecko a uh, crested gecko and a leopard gecko i'm gonna try get a the opposite sex of those animals and then breed them and then i'll use their offspring as food and it's so true most of us will turn a blind eye to the rat breeding operations like okay yes. i have a problem with ball pythons being bred in racks and being unenriched yet i feed a rat that's been in the same conditions which you could argue are even more intelligent than a snake that's left yes that could be, you could say is even in worse conditions than a rack because a lot of people you know feeders don't get the same care that even if you're just a morph breeder that just doesn't care about the enrichment side and you're just got the butcher paper in the water dish it's still gonna be a cleaner setup than the you know the the shed next door with the rats that are just bred for feeders. Hi, I'm Dylan. And I'm Bryce. And you are listening to Roast Sessions on the Animals at Home Network. Roast Sessions are a casual conversation between Dylan and I. We'll cover a wide range of topics, including reptile husbandry, conservation, science, and more. These are rough cut episodes. One take, no edits. Enjoy. Well, welcome to Roast Session number three. It's been a while since we've done this. It's been, I, somehow it's almost been six months, I think, or maybe it's even been more. Yeah, it's been so long. It's it's kind of crazy to think about it. And I'm so sorry for not <laughs> not being able to record anything. It really sucks, but let's get back into it now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no worries. I think we all had a, a long holiday season. It was super busy for everybody. You're getting back into the swing of things. You're getting back into recording podcasts soon. I've had people message me, when's Bryce coming back? And I think yeah, pretty I've, soon. Yes, I've had a few people message me too. And I, I've been super stoked since like end of January to start recording because I've been all well and everything. But at the new place, it's just so far out to get to anywhere. But a few days ago, I recorded my first podcast in like forever, it feels like. And I'm really excited to release it. It's going to be amazing i did have to travel quite a far distance to get there so it how far did you have to drive with it about 50 minutes or so so it's not that far but for me like gas or petrol money it it costs me to go somewhere but yeah yeah well, well i know we're all going to be excited to listen to that one and, and yeah it's because for those of you, I think most people will know that you moved from the original location you were to this new location and it's a lot harder to get people there. So I think you might start trying to do some Zoom ones as well. Yes, I'll definitely try to record a few Zoom ones because I've done it once, I believe, with Herp and Hippie. And yeah, it, yeah. Was really, it was really fun. It's not exactly the same as recording in person, but it's still a lot of fun. How was recording the one this week? Did you feel rusty at all? Did you feel like pretty good recording it? I think I felt a little bit rusty, but we got into the swing of things pretty nicely and the guest was very good at talking. So I <laughs> I didn't need much, oh, yeah, those much experience there either way. So it, it's going to be a great episode. Cool. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So I, the, you posted a couple of videos in the last week or so, and I know that you and we were, I mean, we had talked privately that you were away traveling. So I would love to hear about this trip that you've gone on because you left your snake room, you left your reptiles for, was it two weeks and you went out to the bush? Yeah, 15 days in total. It's a long time to leave your babies, but, <laughs> but it yeah. was totally worth it. Just very stressful too, because leaving your animals is, it's not not the nicest thing because you always worry about things and you have these like scary dreams like oh no my enclosure is flooded like those are my nightmares that's that's what consists of my nightmares not like a mamba trying to bite you but things of oh no my house is on fire what about the animals i'm sure yes. you've had something similar oh. Every time I go, like we, we will go to the cabin for the summertime for a week or two. And, you know, normally I don't leave for more than a few days. I'll, I'll drive back into the city to just check on everything. But, you know, after three or four days of not being home, at least once a day, you have that like 15 minutes of panic where you're like, the house is on fire. Everything's dead. <laughs> you know, like I just, yes. all it, it kind of ruins the vacation in some sense. So, but it, I mean, I think you had somebody coming to check up on things and whatnot, but you must have been, t well, you weren't out of cell service completely because you had messaged me while you were out there yeah so i wasn't completely out of cell service but there wasn't like a great internet connection but i could use my data every now and then um certain places like when i was out hiking and herping i i had no no cellular signal whatsoever so if i needed help or anything like that 
you're on your own, Bryce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So tell me about this trip. What what was the trip? How did this idea come up? And I think it's something that you do on, on some semi-regular basis, maybe not every year, but every couple of years. And just tell me about everything. Yeah, so this is probably my favorite place in Southern Africa. It's called St. Lucia. It's almost like a, it's a subtropical environment on the east coast of Southern Africa. And it's it's so, so beautiful. It's incredible there. It's on the ocean. And then there's the Lake St. Lucia, which is our, I believe, the largest lake in, yeah, it's the largest lake in South Africa. And it's this incredible estuarine system where it now recently is, has been opened up to the ocean. But that's a whole nother topic to <laughs> talk about how man messed up the, the whole ecosystem there just by closing up the natural mouth. But whatever. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely phenomenal. To give you an example, like there are no gates or fences to anything. You can get up close with crocodiles. There are hippos walking in the town at night. Wow. And it's it's kind of weird to see this hippo like chowing someone's grass. There's even been videos of people saying, hey, there's there's a hippo in my pool. They just, they own the place because you are in the wilderness there. Basically, it, it was a family holiday that we all went on because it's our favorite place on the planet and just a time to rest. But you know what that means. When Bryce is in a place to herp, what do you do? You're going to herp. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the main goal uh, was to find a Gaboon Viper, our East African Gaboon Vipers, because that's one of the only places they occur in South Africa. They've got a really small range here. And they're one of my favorite snakes, if not the favorite. So I, I've always wanted to find one, but they're extremely elusive and very hard to find. Like herping in jungle, semi-tropical landscape is not the easiest of things. It's a lot harder than like desert terrain where you, or semi-arid terrain where you can flip rocks and find something. So were you... When you would go out herping, were you by yourself sometimes or sometimes your brother would come? Because it looks like some of the film that you put on YouTube, you're totally alone. Yes, I for the most part, I was totally alone. Whenever I go out herping, it's generally by myself if we're on a family vacation because everyone else wants to do something else and they're not really in interested in herping. So I go and do that by myself. But it's it's amazing because you can almost connect to the wonders of the natural world just being at peace, like not hearing anything besides the wilderness for hours on end while you're walking through the thick brush. Would it be hard to get lost in there? Um. Yeah. No, it wouldn't be too hard to get lost if you're not sticking to a path, which okay. I didn't stick to any path. So growing up in Africa, you kind of, well, I can't say it when you grow up, around the bush and walk in it constantly you almost get like a gps navigation system in your head so you kind of know where you are and you just got to keep walking to find whatever you're looking for so you don't get that lost but it is possible for you to get lost but it it won't be days and days out of help's way per se okay and you didn't end up finding a gaboon viper right no sadly i didn't it's been what like the fourth or fifth year going there in a row, except for last year, COVID, thank you. So yeah, I found nothing, but it is very hard to find them and they're a vulnerable species in South Africa. So there's a lot less of them than mm. other parts of Africa. So did you find any reptile? Oh, you found some great hingeback tortoises. You found, what else did you find? Just some like some common frogs and stuff and well those aren't reptiles but <laughs> a bunch of those tortoises and then just the crocodiles so not not too much i didn't even see any snakes this time generally i'll see some common snake species but and chameleons but this time i didn't find anything mm. but it's still pretty cool to be able to see some wild crocodiles Oh, that was amazing watching them like eat fish in the ocean it was yeah one of the coolest things i've seen had you had that experience before, seeing crocodiles like that up up close? No, I, I've seen crocodiles in the wild up close 
all the time, but I've never seen them actively hunting and using the ocean to their advantage to catch catch fish and stuff like that. And then on that same trip, we actually uh, saw a croc who had killed a water buck. So it's a fairly large antelope, and it uh, it killed it a few days before and was just l- lying next to it obviously chowing whenever it would get hungry probably took like 17 kilograms off of this animal and it was just lying there in the marsh super super fat wow that's amazing and and the the other video that you got was with the hippos and like you're saying they're just kind of wandering through town are they because hippos are notoriously aggressive right or they can be very territorial and dangerous in the town are they kind of sort of not tame but because are they just used to people so it's not that much of a risk yeah, they are used to people, but uh, there are quite a few people like tourists and that that push the hippos buttons. Um, but generally, when they're not in the, the water, they're not really in their safe space. So that can go either of two ways. They either try like run away quicker and if they can't, then they'll probably mess up your vehicle or try and defend themselves when they feel threatened. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely because they are so huge, and you know, I'm sure you don't want to mess with a uh, with a hippo. Sure. And, and yes. the other thing that you did that I commented on the video because I thought this was just so crazy. You just you jump. Was that a lake or was that the ocean that you jumped into? It was like a marshy area, and it was very cloudy water. And you just took off your shirt and jumped in. And I thought, there's no way in hell I'm doing that in the middle of a place <laughs> where there could be crocodiles and who else? Who else? Like what else could be in there? Who knows? Yeah. So. I didn't know what was in there. Yes, there could be crocodiles, but I was pretty certain there wasn't. But then again, that's wherever there's a water system in that area, there could be crocodiles. Even in the roads um, where there's like potholes or something, there could be a crocodile because it's it's so nice and wild. So I didn't know, but I was pretty confident there were no crocodiles. But also I wasn't going to – there's two things going through your mind. Then you – first of all, you don't want to act like prey – and you don't want to act like a predator. So I'm not getting in, making huge splashes. I'm just casually swimming in. And generally, you won't be seen as a food source if you don't act like a food source and you don't panic because there have been people like filmmakers and that that go in the water with wild Nile crocodiles and film them and they're fine as long as you know what, you're doing but still please don't do that because there is the potential and people actually have been taken in that area and it happened it does happen so don't do what i do please thank you (laughs) yeah yeah and people do get eaten and killed by crocodiles so and for me i think because i spent you know so much of my childhood and into my early 20s as being a swimmer living or basically living in clear water pools indoors like I don't even like swimming in lakes where there's only fish is like, if you can't see the bottom it's like very disturbing to me so as soon as I saw you jump into that muddy hole I'm like oh my god that is that is brave yeah so the water was actually pretty clear it looked quite dark in that on camera but it was it was decently clear compared to the the main lake system mm-hmm. where I w- where I've seen most of the crocodiles and it had like a lot of these it's almost like seaweed type of stuff but it's not seaweed because it's fresh water so I have no idea what it is Mm. but it was full like a weed basically in the water so it makes it very hard to move around so that's one of the reasons I thought okay there shouldn't be that many crocodiles here if they are and yeah I'm still alive I'm still here so that's you have all your limbs yeah yes I do and, Even and, all my fingers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and the other thing that you did that I thought was pretty cool was you were taking some, a little bit of, I'm not sure how much of this you did, but you took some data. It looked like you had your IR temp gun and I don't know if you took anything else. So what were you looking for out there as far as information goes? So because it's a subtropical climate, I just wanted to find out like, how are we keeping our snakes and how should we be keeping them compared to where they're actually found in that? So getting some readings and that because of mainly wanting to keep our South African, uh, East African gaboon viper, I was checking because most people keep them really hot, wet and humid and just going around taking temperature readings and where they occur, like in the shady areas where there's lots of shrubs and um, leaf litter, it's actually pretty cold. Um, Not cold, but like it's really cool. There's 
a lot of airflow. So there's never any stagnant humidity around. It's humid, but, and it feels hot. So like I, we first arrived there and we were like, this is crazy hot. And it, we coming from n- the Northern part of South Africa, which was at the time, like 32 degrees Celsius, which isn't too bad. But when we went down there, it was 27 and it felt mm-hmm. super hot to the human flesh in that. It felt way hotter than just because the high humidity up here. Exactly. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of that is perceived when people go to these places, they're like, oh no, it was very hot when I went there and very humid. So then they try to re- replicate that in, in, a, in a snake's enclosure. But your body is not that accurate with reading the temperatures. So taking a temp gun, checking under the leaf litter, because it's it's got a lot of airflow and it's humid, it's actually quite cool on mm-hmm. the in the bottom of the forest floor, which was really interesting. And then... As for the crocodiles, I wanted to check what the temperatures they like um, being in are in this time of year. So I was just trying to get as much information as I could. So what temperature reading were you getting on the forest floor? If it was like 27, 28 degrees outside, what what were you getting for those shady spots? Those shady spots um, were about like 23 degrees Celsius. Okay. Okay. So considerably cooler than everywhere else and then for the hot spots or like parts where the sun is it went up to about 26 27 degrees but because the sun is constantly moving that one spot where there's a bit of like sun leaking through the canopy in the shaded areas it doesn't get overly hot because there's the shade and the shade is constantly moving all the time so we got to think about that too well, and, and for those uh, Americans out there, 23 is like around 73 and 26, 27 is around 78, just so they, they can do the math or the, you know, have a, a frame of reference. But yes. I think that's a really good point that you make is the, our bodies are not good at telling temperatures and they're not. And the easiest way for me to tell this is in, in this, in the fall, as the temperatures drop from like, you know, 25 degrees, as we get into that 15, 12 degree range down into like under 10 degrees, it's really cold. You start bundling up. But in, in the spring, like yesterday or two days ago, it was three degrees outside, beautiful, clear, clear skies, really bright sun. And I'm walking outside with just a shirt because it just feels so warm, but it's such a drastic difference from like the minus 25 that we're just coming out of. So you can't trust your body to tell. And then you add on top of it, the humidity readings, which is I think exactly right. And another sort of story I have personally about that is it gets very humid where I live. We have these massive lakes. So in the summer it gets that same heat. It can be only like 25 degrees, but it'll feel really hot. And I remember when I went to California for a a swim meet years back, it was way hotter, getting up to like 30 degrees. But in the shade, it was really cool because that humidity wasn't sticking to you. And where I live, it doesn't matter if you go into the shade, you're still going to feel tremendously hot because you can't get out of that humid feeling. So you're so right. You can't just take the temperature and and then try to replicate what you're doing. The humidity plays a massive role in that as well. It does. And sadly, I didn't have anything to read the humidity except for like checking the local forecast um, for that area. So, but you can kind of gauge what the humidity is from seeing the forecast. And yeah, your body, your body takes a while to climatize to certain places. And then once you climatize, you read the temperatures totally differently to Mm -hmm. when you're like just visiting through an area. Yeah, exactly. So do you think most people keep their Gaboom Vipers too hot then because of that? Because they're trying to replicate that heat that they felt? Definitely. In South Africa, that is 100% accurate. And that's that's the reason why I believe most of the guys in South Africa can't keep uh, Nasicornus, Bitus Nasicornus, which is the Rhino Viper. They can't keep those alive because I believe those are a lot more sensitive than the Gaboon Vipers. Mm. Um, having said that, most Gaboon vipers in south africa are west african gaboons so they do come from like west africa ghana togo benin those areas where because we can't get our own gaboons here because it's a protected species and you need permits and all this stuff to legally own these animals and get them captive bred and so on and so forth so either way we do keep them way too hot here Mm. 
And are you, is a Gaboon Viper on the list? Like, can you keep an Eastern or do you have to keep a Western? Um, so you have to keep a Western here, but right. uh, I believe you can work towards getting a the Eastern permits. if you get the permits and that it's just very difficult. So that's what I've been trying to do for a few years because it that's honestly my favorite Gaboon Viper, our South African, East African Gaboon Viper. It, it visually, would the layman be able to tell the difference? Because I, I know that I know they are separated. I think at one point they weren't; they were just subspecies. But now they're separate species, right? Yes. So at one point they were all Bitis gabonica, gabonica, and then gabonica rhinoceros, which is the West African one, and then they got split up into two totally different species. Mm-hmm. So the East African found here in South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, um, that that is a smaller snake. It's a lot prettier in my opinion. It has smaller, um, forgot what those scales on their nose are called, nasal, not nasal scales, I think there's a proper term for it, but they've got smaller horns basically. And the biggest difference is the West African has like one dark triangle by its eye and the East African has two. So mm. you can either think of the having two or like a white uh, line cutting the two together oh, that's cool. the east african gaboon viper yeah so what what draws you towards them i mean i think everybody loves a gaboon viper just the way they look is that mostly what draws you towards it yes totally and the east african gaboon viper is a lot prettier in my opinion mm-hmm. like our south african locality one is a lot pinker the colors just pop off more it's not as uh like dull it's it's just a beautiful snake well, one day I hope that you have that in the collection because that would be incredible. Yes, one day. One day is one day and I'm sure I'll get that one day. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, I think we've covered the whole trip. That was awesome. Yes. I, I, hopefully next year you can find that Kaboon Viper. Yes, I really hope so. And uh, there was another thing I was planning on the trip. So it's one of the only places where you can um, check out turtles laying their eggs and at the same time baby turtles hatching that's the green sea turtle the loggerhead and the leatherback so i was gonna go on a trip to check those out but i wasn't able to this time so i'm gonna work towards getting like proper camera gear that or or lighting so i can take with so we can actually see the stuff and hopefully next year we'll be able to do that because does most of that happen at nighttime i guess the laying for sure yes the hatching as well yep most of it happens during the night during the evening so yeah, yeah next, that'd be amazing. next year, February, count, count me in on that. <laughs> well, we will be waiting to see that. Yeah. So let's jump all the way to reptile keeping now, as sure. we've spoken a bit about keeping gaboons and that and getting accurate readings from the wild where they come from. But I think something that we should chat about is the importance of like record keeping. Mm-hmm. Do you personally keep records of everything? Yeah, I personally keep records. I, I'm somebody who, uh, I, I like to keep records for one, but I also like to write things down by hand. I'm not someone that uses an app. I know there's some really neat apps out there that you can scan barcodes and type things in, but I, I like to be able, and even though my printing is horrible, I just like to write things with my hand. So I have a, a chart that I've made on Excel. And maybe that's something I could share with people too, just if, if someone wants a, a template and it just has... Uh, the feeding dates, what I fed, the weights of the meal, and then, you know, anytime they, they produce waste, I, I weigh them and I write the date as well. And then I track shed cycles when, when there's a shed. And then I always leave my sp- my safe spa- or myself space to write if there's any abnormalities, like, okay, it was a bad shed or this, you know, the feces looked weird in this one. And, and then you can track intervals, like how many days between you've fed, how many days between they, they've pooped. And then I also have a place for length as well, which I, you know, maybe once or twice a year I'll measure them. But, and so that's all on a single chart and I just have it for each of the animals that I keep. I, and I don't do it for my geckos, but for my snakes, I do. And what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've always loved also keeping the notes and checking up on the animals and seeing what's what. And as I grew the collection and that last year, I started slacking on that and didn't keep accurate notes. Um, but I'm back at it again. And as you said yourself, writing things down is just, I don't know, it's so much nicer. I also had that reptile scan app at one point and it just didn't work as well as 
a card writing things down or a booklet for each snake. And I'm back to doing that also because I recently visited a friend's place and we chatted about the importance of it. Like he breeds some incredibly rare animals. Was that the video that you put out a couple of weeks ago? Yes. Chris yeah, okay. Jones's place. Yeah. So yeah, that was he awesome. was chatting. He, thank you. <laughs> he was chatting about like how he takes notes of pretty much everything because we don't know how to breed some of these animals. So A, it can help other people, but also so he can learn for the next season. If he didn't produce anything successfully here, you can check, okay, what did I actually do last year? How how can I do something differently? So there's a lot that can go into record keeping, even like science wise. Yo, definitely. So do you have, do you just have like index cards that sit with each animal by their enclosure or do you have a binder or what do you do? So I just basically have a book and then number all of the animals. And then I've written out a few different things, almost like an Excel spreadsheet. And then I have lots of space for excess notes that I want to take because I also want to, what, what I'm checking is like for breeding these animals, I want to know where where do they spend most of their time at this time of year on the cool side on the hot side if so what's what's the temperature of the hot side what's the temperature of the cool side are they active are they slowing down now what is going on so we got to keep all that information because you can't remember everything in your head exactly it's, it's impossible and i know as you get a larger collection it becomes a lot harder to keep track of everything especially if you're writing it down so something like an app is a good thing but i personally do like writing things there's just something about it because you feel more intact with them i don't know if that makes sense yeah well for me it makes sense because i I think some people don't mind texting and and typing that way but for me i like to write and and it's it's weird i think even even if you had one snake, I think it's still valuable to record keep. And I think snakes are a little bit different than lizards for this, for the reason that they can go so long between feeds. And so it's just so much easier when you have things written down and you go, okay, oh yeah, I remember I fed them on, on April 2nd and this is what I fed them. And you know, now it's three or four weeks later, you're not thinking like, Hey, when was it last week that I fed them? Was it two weeks ago? And with your geckos, like you're going to feed them, you know, once or twice a week or a couple times a week anyway. So you don't think about that and it's not constant, but with, with snakes, I feel like it's just really helpful because everything is so few and far between that even with one animal, it can be, it can be huge. Yes, especially like with your large animals, you're like, when last did I feed my anaconda? Oh, wait, it was a month ago. Okay, so I should feed her something again now or, you yeah. know, because you ca- you do forget. And what did she eat last time? What was her response? Was she Did she look like she wanted to eat something bigger? What's going on there? Exactly. Well, and I... So I, I fastened my snakes through the winter and I guess it was it sort of February ish I brought my little carpet python out of out of the fast. So I, I fed him two little tiny quails. They were like eight grams each because I wasn't sure how, how he would take them. And he took them no problem. And those passed through a system totally fine. And then the next two feeds after that were about maybe three weeks apart each. I fed him, I think, an African soft fur and maybe just a rat pup. So I was just sort of starting to play with varying his diet. But the second two feeds after the quail, they were really weird. It was A, very loose stool. B, he was he was going to the bathroom like only two or three days after eating, which was really weird. And I can look back on the data and go, okay, normally he passes his waist six to seven days after I fed him. And now it's only two to three days. Something's up here. And, and then he would go like two or three days in a row, almost like a not quite diarrhea, but very soft. And, but I can track all of that and I, I can know exactly what's normal for him. And so I, I called the vet and, and you know, those are the questions the vet asks, like how, how often does he normally go? And I have all of it there. And so I ended up doing yes. a stool sample and, and uh, there was nothing wrong with him. I'm not sure. I think it might've been something to do with the fasting and maybe just kind of working his digestive system back up. Or it could have been yes. just, you know, varying the diet for the first time in his life. I've, I've now fed him a quail and an African soft fur when he's only eaten rats for his whole life. And maybe that changed the, the gut biome or something. And it, it doesn't really matter, but now I have all of this information here yes. and I can track. So now you cave. can see, is something wrong? Exactly. 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 Yeah. So thankfully nothing was wrong. The, the fecal test came back totally fine. And, and I fed That's him last news. week and yeah, and, and he's still digesting the meal that I fed him last week. So there's not been any sort of soft stool again, but that's a perfect example of if the vet had said, well, how, how, how long does he normally take? And if I didn't have an answer for that, then it would be much harder to, to start diagnosing. 
Yes, exactly. So personally, I, I've also varied some of my snakes' diet, and I've I've like fed my cobras snakes, and when they eat snakes, they also have a really runny stool and it doesn't seem like their body digests it. So I don't know if it's just a different prey item or if it's something they're not used to, but there is something weird that goes on there. Did you, did you like increase your temperatures all of a sudden, like rapidly from winter temps to summer? The, the temperatures didn't change drastically. So that's why I'm thinking, you know, it's probably more so what, what you're saying is that the digestive system's just not ready for it. Because even in humans, if you drastically change your diet over like a week, maybe you just go from eating no veggies to only veggies or, you know, people when they go to like a vegan diet or some people go to a carnivore diet, which I'm sure some people think is crazy. But, you know, some people do that where they'll just eat meat for a while to as a like, sort of a hypoallergenic type diet. That normally yes. happens. You get like a diarrhea type thing and it could be just the gut just di- just sort of revolving back into, you know, what it should be. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but, you know, the gut biome is used to digesting rats and now you're feeding it a bird or a snake and it, it may not work at first. So do you find that yeah. the, if you feed snakes, if you feed snakes snakes, do they eventually become, do, does the stool become more formed after a few feedings? I, I can't say because I haven't fed enough snakes to know that yet. Okay. Um, but I'll definitely keep that info recorded and try find out about that but i'll also ask a few friends that do feed their animals snakes because i do think they get used to it but then again i've seen some stuff of king cobras that only eat snakes and they still have like a really runny and smelly stool Mm -hmm. i think it's just something that comes along with it too maybe yeah that could be what in the wild maybe that's what their stool is like i'm not exactly sure yeah and It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing that it's a runny stool. So personally, with your carpet python having like a runny stool, I thought it would have been from like drastic temperature changes to becoming like really hot. So the digestive system is working almost over time. And then it doesn't actually get all the nutrients out of the food. And it's just expelling it too quickly because it's working really fast. So I thought it could have been that. But if the temps are the same, probably not. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. The vet didn't seem to be too worried about it. And and uh, actually, if anyone goes, anybody should listen to the episode of the Morelia Python radio that they did a couple, was it two months ago with Zach, Dr. Zach Lofman because they talk about snake digestion and how how fasting the snake changes the digestive system. Sort of they shut down that system completely while they're fasting. And then as soon as they feed them again, it sort of fires up. So it's I, I recommend everybody go listen to it because it's a uh, highly interesting. So that was, I was listening to that episode as I was going through this experience. So in my head, I was thinking, you know, it could be just, you know, firing things back up again for the first time. And I think I fasted him for 50 days. So, you know, it had been quite a few weeks, seven weeks or whatever. And so, yeah, it could have just been firing up. And, and, and one thing, one other thing that I'll say about record keeping, I, I used to be extremely strict. So every time they would pass waste, I would take the snake out and I'll weigh them. And that way I'm tracking their weights. And I still do that with my boas because it's relatively easy. But with my carpet python, it is a big pain to get him out because he's pretty small. It's a big enclosure and he's got just tons of stuff to grab onto and hold onto. And it's it's just stressful for him. So now, you know, if I'm cleaning the enclosure, if he's in a place where I don't need to pull him out, I don't even have to really pull him out. I can just, you know, clean the enclosure and deal with the waste. And I won't pull him out and weigh him unless he's in a position that it could be easy. Now, sometimes I do pull him out because if I'm doing a big clean and whatnot, and I'll take the opportunity to weigh him then. But basically, I just had to sort of loosen the amount of times that I weigh him. It's like, okay, it's okay to not have to weigh him every time he produces waste or, you know, you know has a bowel movement. Instead, it, maybe it's only a couple of times a year I weigh him. And that still gives yes. me the understanding that he's growing and he's, you know, achieving a healthy weight. Exactly. And it, it's it's not bad if you skip some things and you forget, oh, I didn't see that poop here. He pooped in the back corner, whatever. That's not so serious. As long as you just, in general, start looking into your animals more because you'll actually find more enjoyment out of it and get more joy out because you like you feel more in touch with it because you know what's going on in your animal's life like oh he should be in shed cycle now this he usually takes like this long to be in shed cycle when should i expect him to have another shed does it change if he eats more does it change Mm -hmm. if he eats less it should 
that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'll I'll upload a PDF version of mine if anybody wants to see, you know, as an example of the of the Excel sheet that I use that I just print off and, and fill in by hand because I think it's it's helpful. I do, I do too. Like personally, I with my snakes now, I can see something is changing. We just about to get go into winter. It's getting cooler here, and all of the snakes are becoming super, super active. And you're like, "Why would they become active? It's colder." Well, they know it's going to get a lot colder than it is now, and they're looking for like that last meal before winter. Yeah. Because I also fast my snakes, so they're wanting to eat a bit more now. How many more meals do you have before you fast them, or is it just maybe just one? Um, I think I will. The cobras, I'll probably give two, but that might even be two meals within the same week. Um, I might just give them one or two rats at one feeding just to bulk them up before they go into brumation slash hibernation, whatever you want to call it. Um, And how long will you fast them for? Probably just as like... I will check out what the weather's doing. So if it is a hotter day and you can see, okay, the forecast is going to get quite a bit warmer the next week, I might feed them then. Mm, okay. um, but for some of the species that I'm going to try breed, I'll probably go from like mid-April now to July, August, only then starting to feed them. Yeah, so just kind of getting into the spring, the beginning of spring. Wait. Exactly. Yeah, spring, yeah. It's got to flip, yeah, it, so flip it around th- in my head. That'll be the end of winter, basically, as start, as soon as it starts to warm up. But it also depends on what the season's like. If it's a colder winter, it may last longer. If it's a shorter winter, you feed them sooner. It, you just got to listen to nature. What species were you thinking of trying to breed this year? So this year, the ball pythons again. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's not the animals that I'm going to fast like throughout the whole time it's going to be the wrinkles that i'm going to be focusing on predominantly because they're a difficult ish species to breed most people don't get it right even a lot of the people in europe so i'm wanting to breed those and that'll be exciting document everything see what's happening there the biggest thing with them is leaving them alone and letting them get pretty cold so like up down to eight nine degrees celsius which is wow. insane but then then bringing it back up again in the daytime so it, which is quite strange so nighttime cold spots of like nine degrees and then daytime goes up to 23 depending on the day so how do you achieve that low of a temperature in that in your room or do they get moved I, somewhere else I, i'm probably going the room might get that temperature but the cages won't get to that temperature okay because they're surrounded by other cages that have heating so i'll probably put them in a hibernation tub somewhere close to like the one end of the room that's really cold um or in the other room where there's a bathroom and the window is constantly open with that huge extractor fan and then what will you do with the offspring will those be you'll just sell them to friends that are looking for that species Probably. I I honestly have no idea. I might want to send some of them over to Europe um, so the guys there can have proper captive bred animals and a different locality to what's out there Um, because my locality isn't that common in the trade around the world. Generally, you see those banded wrinkles, the really pretty orange and black ones. Mine are pure black, so... It'll be cool to have something different. How venomous are the runkles? So they are medically significant. There's anti-venom for them, but they are not nearly as potent as the other snakes that are in our polyvalent anti-venom. So our polyvalent anti-venom is created up with quite a few different snake species. The A few of the mambas, the gaboon vipers, the puff adders, different cobras all sorts like that and then the runkos Mm. um and the runkos is probably the least potent of the animals i read something recently saying they're not actually sure why runkos were even put in it because they're not a snake that accounts for many bites at all they're a pretty docile animal interesting yeah i was actually listening to a podcast I think it was Snake Talk. I don't know if you've seen that podcast, but I had the, the host of the podcast on a few weeks ago and uh, his podcast, I think it was a South African 
yeah, yeah, it was a professor from South Africa, and they were talking about stiletto snakes, and how those are one of the more common snakes, snake bites in South Africa because people are const because you, they're so kind of unassuming. And when you someone had posted a great video the other day of when when you know they're sort of curled up on the ground, deadly, like people aren't going to die from them, but they're going to cause you some pain. Yeah, they're going to cause you like a mountain of pain because it's a cytotoxic venom. So many people do they lose digits or just they don't do well with it because it's so, so painful. So then you would just treat it symptomatically by giving you lots of fluids, helping your body fight that off. And then, yeah, because there's also no antivenom just because there's no real need because they're not that toxic. Yeah, but what a they're, weird they're species. Of, they are. They, they're super weird. And they almost, they lift their head or they keep their head on the ground and they lift their neck up like this when they are really grumpy and wanting to bite you. And then they'll like side swipe. It's, yeah. It's kind of crazy. And most people get bitten by picking them up and then messing with them. And then the snakes get upset and then they just prick them with the side of their fang. And that's it. You've been bitten because most people don't know. Stiletto snake looks kind of like a harmless snake, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have, to, it doesn't have to open its mouth to bite you. It's just going to swipe its head towards the side. And I guess if people try to like neck the snake or something, they're going to yes. get hit in the thumb or the index finger. Exactly. Many people here have seen it on TV. So then you try and neck it and that's when things go wrong too. Yeah. Because you can't neck a stiletto snake safely. Interesting. Yeah, that is wild. Um, so anyway, so that so that'll be cool. Uh, we'll definitely kind of keep track of the your success with the the runkles. I think that would be a cool. That would be the first time you've bred that species, right? Yes, it will be, and I'm super super excited about it because, yeah, they, they're such amazing animals. I never really liked them previously, but then when I've started working with them, then I was like, wow, this this animal is incredibly amazing i mean they have the ability to spit but mine never spit at me they they hood up nicely for camera or whatever but they they don't strike at your open mouth and try and kill you 24 7 yeah. so it's it's a nice thing yeah yeah and anything you can do to you know add some more captive bred animals to the hobby is always huge yeah it's nice and some that won't aren't necessarily available overseas so hopefully I'll get those out and then there's no need for wild caught animals. Yeah, exactly. Well, while we're kind of in this domain here, we're talking about record keeping and feeding and changing diets. Should we chat a little bit about varying the diets and, and sort of feeding in that natural, we kind of touched on it already, feeding snakes, you know, feeding snakes as feeders. And uh, we kind of briefly talked about this the other day that, you know, it's weird as reptile keepers because it, it's. It, I think it could be hard for people to feed reptiles other reptiles, feeding, you know, yes. feeding lizards off, like feeder lizards or feeder frogs or even feeder snakes is kind of a weird, it's almost hits too close to home for a lot of us. Yet we do it with rats. And for a lot of people, rats are probably a more popular pet than reptiles and people will be very offended by that. So there is a bit of a disconnect. I think sometimes we kind of just turn a cheek to to not have to accept the fact that what we're feeding could be considered a pet. So but you add the ethical side to it where if some of these animals are in the wild eating 6 50 60% of their diet is reptile based how bad is it if we feed them rodents 100% of their life it probably is unethical in that sense so where do you sit on this on this fact yeah on this so, debate so personally like it's it's very difficult seeing a snake eat a snake and it's not that nice but it's what happens. It's the natural circle cycle of life. And we got to be okay with that because it's what happens and it's actually better for your animal. So like there's so, so many ball pythons out there that people don't know what to do with. And they make a great food source for other snakes too, to vary a diet. So for instance, now I'm going to also try breed my puff adders this year. My puff adders are two different localities. One, so that's generally something I would not want to do, but none of the babies are going to be available and be grown up for that. The reason for them is they are going to become food for my other snakes because Cape Cobras, which I also own, really, really enjoy eating puff adders. It's almost like a delicacy. 
So for my two Cape Cobras, I can split up. She'll probably have maybe 25 babies, my puff adder. I can split that up and they can have a few nice puff adders as a treat per se, but it's also really good for their diets because it's what they would naturally try and find in the wild. Like they go crazy over puff adders, which is, it's weird. Yeah. Will you euthanize them pretty much right away or will you grow them a little bit larger or are they too, so how does that work? I will, pr- it depends honestly because I, I might give some away to friends also for feeding their snakes, yeah. but I think I might grow up a few, but not to adult size, um, maybe sub adult size and then feed them off to the cobras. But also I'm not going to feed life, just like with rodents, you don't want to feed life. Right, yeah, yeah, that's good. I remember a, a few months ago, I was talking to Ashley Dezan, who is a, an importer in Canada. She imports lots of different captive bread, lots, mostly captive bread, but also some wild caught. And one of the things that she does as well is she imports a bunch of, I forget the species, but little lizards and frogs that she euthanizes on arrival and uses them as feeders because there are so many snakes that you can't even feed them rodents. You can try, but they, yes. they, they'll regurgitate it. And, you know, they're not, their digestive systems are not designed for, you know, the amount of hair and fat that comes with a mammal. So in some ways, it could unlock more species within the hobby if we did start offering some lizards or feeder lizards and, and feeder snakes. And, and just like you're saying, you know, the rescues are, there's a lot of rescues that are full of ball pythons. And I know this is kind of walking a bit of a tightrope here because it's kind of hard yeah. to talk about, but because i mean you you wouldn't want you wouldn't do this with dogs just euthanize them and to feed them to tigers you'd feel really bad about that that doesn't seem right but with with ball pythons you know we have rescues that are being overrun with all these ball pythons maybe in some cases they should be euthanized and fed to food if that's more of an ethical food source for other animals that we have in captivity yeah it's it's obviously a very very touchy subject that's why personally i'm growing up stuff to like breed and use myself not Mm -hmm. like buy someone's ball python or get a rescue and then feed it off to something because that is a very sensitive topic at the moment and you don't really want to do that but oftentimes I don't know about you but I've regularly I get offered a bunch of animals and generally I say no to them because I don't want that species or whatever but you can ask the people especially the people that don't want these animals anymore and don't want to care for them you can ask them okay do you want me to rehome this or do you not mind what i do with these animals Mm -hmm. and some people will probably not mind and then you can humanely euthanize them and then feed them off so like you were saying with the geckos i'm gonna also try breed geckos because there's quite a few snake species that only eat geckos right yeah, and uh, and it's a weird conversation because, but people who keep rats and mice as pets see it as just as wrong. So we, we kind of yes. have to accept that. And so, you know, when I look at how, what a wild boa constrictor eats in the wild, it's, I, I, what is the breakdown on that one paper I saw? It was like 40% reptiles, 40%, or I think, it, I forget exactly, but it was the majority of their diet was birds and reptiles combined. So that might've made up like 60% or 70% of their diet. And I'm thinking like, no wonder we have so many fat snakes in the hobby because you're constantly feeding them fat rats. And especially when people get into the jumbo size, you're talking about a big rat and that's a lot of adipose tissue that these snakes aren't necessarily used to. And then you feed them, you know, more frequently than we should. Where a reptile, a snake, a lizard and a bird is going to be a lot leaner of a meal and probably more healthy. So I think that if, for my boas, since, you know, a huge part of their diet is reptiles, I can just, you know, birds are almost reptiles at that point. So I can start feeding more chicken and quail and maybe make that like 60 to 70% of the diet and use rats and rabbits as, you know, only a few times a year. Because, you know, in the wild, they're still going to ca- hit those those prey when they, they do come along, but it's going to be mostly reptiles and birds. So I think I've started to feed quail and they those have gone down really well and they seem to like them. And that's probably closer to reptile. Yes, that that's what's crazy. Like, imagine how much longer these animals were would live in captivity if we fed them the proper diets. Because I know most of them die from probably being overfed and being really large and fat individuals. Because wow, big snake, big retic. 
that's not good for the animal. Yeah. Please don't do that. Um, there's, there's a lot of species, especially in the venomous world, that are almost impossible to keep in captivity because guys keep trying to force feed these animals rodents when their natural diet is something like frogs. So why not just offer frogs? Yes, rodents are easier, but give the animal what it needs and it will then thrive. Yeah, exactly. And I think Ashley, um, the the importer that I was talking about, she she was telling a great story on the podcast that I had her on where she had, I forget what species this was again, I just everything gets, you know, combined into one in my head, but it was a species that only eats frogs in the wild. So she went to like great detail to skin a mouse or a rat and make it so it was, you know, it, it looked like a frog as far as she could tell. And then she, you know, scented it with frog and the and actually, the snake did take it, so she was, thought it was a success. But you know, a day or two later, regurge. So yeah, you yes. don't have the flexibility that we think. You just and we think rats are easy just because that's what's done. But I mean, geckos are can be just as easy to breed as rats, especially if you get something like a morning gecko. You don't even have to do anything; they're just going to constantly be reproducing if what you're feeding is small enough, where that is a suitable prey size. Exactly. So it's all about possibly even the animals you keep as pets per se breed those and feed them to the other animals you have so like i have crested gecko i had crested gecko and a leopard gecko i'm gonna try get a the opposite sex of those animals and then breed them and then i'll use their offspring as food Mm -hmm. so even though i'm not going to feed the adults because i have the attachment to them if i know okay i'm raising these babies up for fee food to feed my snakes that's cool because then you're almost making like a natural cycle in your own little reptile room because the snake, the ball python is going to be fed to the king cobra, the puffetta is going to be fed to the cape cobra, so on and so forth, but also varying it, keeping it fresh and new. Yeah, and it, I, and it, is, it is so weird to think about feeding baby crested geckos when, you know, because in another situation, those babies would be going to homes and becoming pets. But in the exact same situation with rats, the same deal. Like, you know, I follow a couple of vets on, on Instagram and, you know, they're always taking pictures of what animals they have on the on their, you know, checkup table for the day. And, you know, sometimes it's a rat, sometimes it is a quail, sometimes it's you know, different things. And I think that, you know, in another scenario, those would actually just be food. So you would never take them to the vet because they're just going to be fed off. Yeah, this is somebody's loving pet. So I could see why someone would go, oh, you're, they're listening to you say you're going to breed crested geckos to feed. That's evil. You can't do that. But we do it anyway with, with the rats. Like it's a very strange, it's hard it to talk is. about. And I think what will help that is like having your breeder pair of crested geckos. You know that's your pet. You're not going to feed those animals off. They're in a nice naturalistic um, planted setup. Okay, great. When they breed, you know, okay, those babies, I'm still going to look after them properly, feed them everything like correctly because what they eat, my snake will eat essentially. Mm -hmm. So you still give them that extra care and then feed them to your, your snake or whatever needs it. Just like personally, I breed rats and I've also come across this dilemma. Like I've got rats in racks. How ethical is that? Even though I don't have that many in each tub, is it is it okay for them to be in something like that? So I've thought of making like these huge greenhouses where I just had f- have free roaming rats and planted enclosures where the rats just roam free, essentially parasite free too. So I can feed those to my snakes. So it it's it's. It's a really touchy subject, but slowly but surely I'm making small improvements to get somewhere like that. Not just feeding the rodents pellets, varying their diets. They get bones, they get vegetables, fruits. Um, Now I've started breeding worms and the worms are going to also be fed to some of the rats. And, you know, making your own little cycle. So everything has, has a part, which is like what nature is. Yeah. And it's so true. Most of us will turn a blind eye to the rat breeding operations. Like, okay, yes. I have a problem with ball pythons being bred in racks and being unenriched, yet I feed 
a rat that's been in the same conditions, which you could argue are even more intelligent than a snake, that's left. Yes. That could be, you could say is even in worse conditions than a rack because a lot of people, you know, feeders don't get the same care that even if you're just a morph breeder that just doesn't care about the enrichment side and you're just got the butcher paper in the water dish, it's still going to be a cleaner setup than the, you know, the, the shed next door with the rats that are just bred for feeders. So it we, we yeah. do kind of straddle both worlds. I think it's just a lot of willful blindness on our part where we just go, ah, let's just not look at that. As far as I'm concerned, the rats are in my freezer. That's all I that, that's the only time I interact with them. Exactly. And that's 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 where I also like stumble as someone I love my rats and I breed the rats to feed the snakes. But I'm trying to do what I can now to enrich the the rodents lives as well even though they're going to end up in the freezer and feeding my snakes but my snakes might become healthier because the rats are healthier i think the biggest thing is probably space i think we give rats not enough space because they're mammals that run around quite a bit and now they're stuck in these little tubs yeah so it's very it's a very difficult subject to talk about because i mean as i said i breed rodents myself i have rodents in racks but i i think the best thing you can do is slowly try and improve what you're doing over time yeah and I think I think using reptile feeders is going to become more popular. People are going to realize that that's actually necessity for keeping some of the animals healthier. And if we already have a snake in captivity, I think it's our ethical duty to, you know, provide them with what they would have in the wild. Give them, give them what they are naturally predisposed to deal with. And and if that happens to be reptiles, then we kind of have to do it. And and like you said, you could still keep keep them in an enriching way. So it uh, yeah, it's. It's an interesting conversation, that's for sure. I'm sure some people get a little bit uptight about it, but it's just the nature of caring for carnivores. That's just the only way to put it. Exactly. And it's it's kind of like if we go on the food topic again of us humans, personally, I like eating free-range stuff way more. You can actually taste the difference. Yeah. So essentially what we must try to do is free-range food for your animals too because i'm sure the animals can taste the difference and i'm sure it has a huge impact on their health too even though it may take many many years to discover what the benefits are what's what's wrong with trying to make a huge greenhouse full of rodents and like a permaculture field where they feed themselves yeah exactly i think that would be really cool I i think so too it's definitely a project i want to work on well, I think that's good. I think that's a good starting point for that natural diets discussion. It's something that we can think about some more, and I'm sure the listeners will have something to say about it as well because, yeah, it, it's kind of one of those strange areas. Um, what do we want to jump on to next? Well, I wanted to ask you, you haven't gotten any more animals recently, so I wanted to ask, is there anything like in the pipeline for you, and are you like planning setups for an animal months or years before actually getting something that you really, really want? Well, I, I, yes and no. The The first thing is I need more space. So that's really what's, you know, stopped me from doing anything more. Like I'm kind of maxed out. In in September, I'm moving to a bigger place. I'm going to have more okay. space. So there could be potential there to get something new. But at the same time, I think I would go towards growing the enclosures that I have first before getting yes. anything new. And I, I had mentioned this on a podcast I recorded a, a few weeks ago. It was a roundtable one where we're discussing you know, getting into reptiles and what you should expect getting into reptiles. Now, I love my snakes, but they're bigger than I wish they were in a lot of ways. And I, and in some ways, I wish that I didn't, you know, it's not that I wish that I didn't get them, but they are big snakes. You know, I have two two snakes that are going to be six, seven foot long, maybe more. My Central American bull will stay small. He's probably basically full full grown, but I have to provide a good amount of space for them, for me to feel good about keeping them and it's not really anything I thought about when I first got them right it was just like oh you get the six foot enclosure and then you're good but now I'm thinking like should they be in an eight foot or a ten foot you know eventually when I have a home I'd love to build them something huge and so that's kind of my main focus there are a few species that I would love I'm I'm really liking those I forget the common name but they're just going to soma Oxycephalum. Or wow, so you're getting into scientific names now that this is like this is huge too well, I got these books I got <laughs> Well, I got a bunch of books and I'm slowly, and, and you know, as soon as you start getting to the obscure species, you have to go to Latin because 
you know, yes. everything's just called a green snake. So I got this South African snakes of South East Asia, which is pretty cool. And, and okay. I, I really love those green rat snakes. And I, I want a colubrid that's active and diurnal. And I think I could do some really cool, you know, large arboreal type enclosures and, but keep them, you know, the snakes are only three to four feet, which would be, which would be cool. But then I also got, you'll, maybe you saw me post this on Instagram, snakes of Southern Africa. Oh, okay. That, that's pretty cool. I mean, I've done a podcast with Johan Marais, so that, yeah, that's so awesome. I got both of Johan's books and he got the, this one as well, Snakes and Snake Bite. So there's also a few South African species in there that are really cool, but I, I really like green snakes and yes. there's a lot of green snakes to choose from. And so that's kind of what I've realized now is like, I, what I should have done is pick what I like and then go find a species that looks like that and has the, you know, natural attributes of what I'm looking for. So for me, it's diurnal. Uh, I like active snakes. I like snakes that are arboreal and there's a lot to choose from. And, you know, had I, had I just jumped in with green snakes, maybe I would have got a green tree python that is relatively nocturnal and not very active. And, you know, I didn't do that because they're very expensive where I live, but now I have all these different options. So anyway, that's a very long winded way to answer your question. So there are definitely some, a few species of Asian rat snakes for sure that I have my eye on and maybe some South African snakes if they're, if, if it's possible for me to find them, but space is the first thing I want to address, especially with the ones that I currently have. Yeah. I think that's, that's a huge thing. Like, fix what you have first before thinking about getting something new but also in the back of your head think about what you want to get either way like personally there's a few animals I've been wanting to get for like five or six years now that I've been working towards I haven't got them yet but I know I want them done the research well not done constantly doing the research on them and then one day when the opportunity comes up, you know you'll be able to take it. Because especially with these obscure species, it's not just like you can go down the road and buy it. It's like you'll be really lucky to find one available. Exactly, yeah. I think one day it would be cool to work with a species that is rare in the hobby that you can work towards a captive bred operation like you're doing with the Runkles, right? Yes. Like maybe there's only a few people in North America that work with a certain species and is it possible to import a few in and then start working that way? I think that would be really interesting. There's so many different species out there and I, I don't so want to gravitate many. towards having a massive collection because I am someone that, I wouldn't say I'm a relatively anxious person, but I don't, I don't do well with having too many things that are just you know that 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 can change over time and, and that's probably yes. not a great way of explaining it but i don't think i would do well with a collection of like 20 animals to me that would just be stressful i'd be constantly worrying about things so i think i do need to maintain a small collection and uh so yeah right now i'm i'm happy with what i have yeah well well i thought my collection is small and i've got like 20 animals <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> but, yeah but that's comparing to like other friends who have like 200 plus animals i don't so, get how I just don't get how people can do it. It might, it might be a personality thing because I, like I said, I'm very rigid. I have lists. I have things that I want done at certain times. And yes. And in a know, certain way, properly type of thing. Exactly. Exactly. That's one of the, you know, to talk about something that's not reptile keeping fish keeping, for example, I used to have this big fish tank in my living room and I hated it because whenever there was something slightly off, I couldn't even relax in the living room. Like, okay, the water's like a little bit cloudy or that fish looks a bit off or, you know, whatever it is. It was constantly this like sore thumb in the living room of me just wanting to have it perfect all the time. And that's why I would never keep reptiles in a place where I would be sitting a lot, which is kind of funny. People think like, oh, you want to have like this display room. I like the idea of having an amazing room that you can walk through, but I wouldn't want that to be my relaxing space because I personally yes. would not be able to relax there. I'd be constantly judging what I'm looking at. Where could I be better? What's wrong with each enclosure? So and I think if that number gets too big, I don't think I'd be able to enjoy life as much personally. Yes, I think that goes exactly with what Chris Jones was saying in that video. Finding something that's manageable for you personally and not exceeding that. So knowing, okay, these are the species I want to work with. This is, I want to unlock how to breed these species and don't go huge. Like, yeah. because then, as he said, as soon as you start start cleaning all the time it becomes like a chore and then it's it's not fun anymore exactly yeah you want to be able to enjoy the routine and so i have a, a relatively co uh, consistent routine sunday mornings for sure is where i do lots of the snake work 
whether that's feeding or cleaning or changing waters, obviously I, ch- I change waters throughout the week as well, but Sunday is the day where I really like scrub things down and clean things out and, and I actually enjoy it. I'll put a podcast on and I'll spend like an hour and a half, two hours of just going through each enclosure and, and setting them up. And then you feel like, okay, that's good. You got a whole seven days before you have to come back and do, you know, major maintenance again. And, but I don't, that I couldn't do that daily. If I did that daily, I would start to hate it. But Sunday morning, I wake up, I get the podcast posted, and then I put the podcast, a, a, you know, a, a different podcast in, whatever, whatever I want to listen to, and I do my snake work, and I enjoy it. But that can't be every day. Yeah, it's almost therapeutic, but as soon it as it becomes too much, it's no longer therapeutic. Yeah, yeah. Because I actually enjoy cleaning just in general. Like, like when my apartment gets messy, I enjoy the process of cleaning, putting the dishes away. And even though, you know, most people don't like that, there's something that feels good about that to me. So that's kind of, you know, I get the pleasure and, and yeah, the, sort of that meditative des- meditative feeling out of working in the snake room as well. But yeah, you don't want it to become work. So w- we'll see. I think I, I would love to work with a species one day that it could be a captive bred for the first or second time in captivity type thing. And maybe that'll be a future, but for now I'm happy with what I have. Is there, is there anything specifically like from South Africa that you've seen that you're like, okay, I want to work with something like that. Well, there's another green snake. Let me see if I can find it. I, I, I personally am going for like the orange snake. There's one that I really, really want to get into and that's the Eastern tiger snake. Oh, there is that stunning. South African as well? Yes, it is. It's a really so pretty snake. In that book, I'll find I'll find it in this book at some point. But yeah, there's oh, what is that species? It's been a while since I've looked at this. I know it's definitely not a venomous. It'll be in the harmless side. Um, it's probably one of the Philothamnus yeah. obligaster or Semivarigatus. Spotted oh, yeah, bush yeah. snake. Natal yes, green yes, spotted snake. bush snake. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Here it is. Yeah, spotted bush snake. There's and there's a couple of them, right? There's the ornate green snake and the Angola green snake which that's why you have to get into the scientific names because everything's just called a green snake yes i just like the way those look they almost kind of look like a green mamba in a way but they're not yes so are you personally like more in love with the spotted bush snake or the other ones well i don't know which one do you think i should <laughs> first I off i have no clue if i have no clue if this is even if these are, are in captivity are they in captivity in south africa um yes a few of them there's a few guys that have bred them captively but most of them, I think, I believe, get released because they're gecko eaters, and oh, okay. So you you would need to work on getting a supply of geckos then. Yeah, so that does complicate it. But I, I do I like the spotted bush snake as well as the Angolan or the Angola green snake. They both look they're they're both just really neat looking animals. Yeah, they are. They're really nice, and that green is just like it's green. It's it's a proper proper color. Have you ever do you ever see them in the wild? Yeah, so those are actually pretty common species to find out okay. in the wild. Not common in captivity, but in the wild, they're they're pretty common, and they're they're really nice snakes. They and yeah, they don't get huge or anything. No, they're not, but they do need big enclosures because they're super active. Yeah, and see, that's what I think would be cool is you know, like we talked about a, a while ago, is offering smaller snakes huge enclosures, especially if they're very active. And I've seen a few videos of them online, and you know, they're quite small snakes, and yeah, they're the ones that will just shoot up a tree within a few seconds, type thing. And you would have to provide them good space for them to essentially run. Heck yes, like they love large amounts of space, and it's not it's not fair on them giving them small little things when they are good at darting through the bushes really quickly. Yeah. So is it weird with somebody wanting to keep a snake that you see so common in the wild? Well, I personally don't see it so commonly uh, where I live because they don't occur here. But where I was down and filmed those videos, that's where, that's one of the places that they occur quite frequently. Um, And throughout like the subtropical part of Southern Africa, they're quite common snakes. Um, yeah, but sh- but yeah, no, it's not weird at all because I personally love them so much, and I don't know why more people don't want to work with them in South Africa. It's weird how we have some of the most beautiful snakes, yet most of the guys here want to work with exotics. Yeah, that's why I'm yeah. like indigenous. I know the only thing with that is it's a lot harder to work with them where I live in South Africa because you need all the permits and that's a long process of paperwork, spending money, waiting and waiting for the 
stuff to go through and being inspected and it's it's a whole mission on its own but there are parts where you live in south africa that you don't need permits too yeah well and and that's why i got these books because well first off i want i just wanted to spend money (laughs) like it sounds weird you ever get into those things where you just like want to buy something new yes and so i thought okay i'll I'll buy some books because then you spoil yourself yeah, exactly. And and books is a lot easier to take care of than another snake. So uh, I got these books and, and you don't get exposed to like 95% of the species that are out there. And so you can flip through these books and just find things that look cool. You can read about them, whether or not you want to keep them at some point in the future doesn't really matter, but at least it exposes you to what else is out there. And then that's where, you know, importers come in because a lot of these species, species are actually common in the pet trade. We just don't realize it because they're not common where I am, for example. Exactly, that's so true. Um, there's there's so many so many cool species, and that's one of the main things. Like with the Preservation Institute, that I want to work with, even common species that are not common in captivity. So th- then we can have them in captivity, and people can have a nice variety of like what to choose from. Because I'm personally not of the opinion of like get a ball python, it's the best beginner snake. Get a corn snake or whatever. To a large extent it doesn't really matter what you start out with obviously there are like guidelines and that but as long as you do the proper research and have the proper setup rather go for the animal that you really love like if you wanting to get into snakes and you first want a green tree python get that but do the proper research know that they can be a bit more nippy if you haven't had experience handling handling any snakes do what you love rather. Yeah, I I, I definitely agree, I think. Because then you end up with a snake that you're not super passionate about and mm-hmm. as you're like training wheels. And, and like you said, uh, there's a ton of snakes out there that are species out there that are actually relatively simple to care for. They're, they're similar. Like if you can care for a ball python, you can care for a bunch of different colubrids. You can get, you know, it, it doesn't, in, in some sense, colubrids are even, can be easier because depending on where you live, sure. if you have, depending on what your relative humidity is or your sort of natural the heat of the day and and whatever there are definitely lots of options so I, I completely agree yeah snakes snakes are just amazing i don't know why i'm so drawn to them yeah they're just the coolest animals on the planet yet i say that about everything and i know i say that a lot <laughs> well okay this, this dovetails nicely into what i what i've been thinking about lately with sort of using herpticulture as a creative outlet and, and I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that i think when people are creative or in a space where they can be creative, that's when they get the most joy out of life. And so that can, you can be creative in a million different ways, whether that's drawing pictures or painting a picture or creating music or editing videos and making film. And there's just so many different ways. And I think that part of, I think a huge part of herpticulture and the joy that comes out of keeping reptiles is that creative energy that you get through studying the animal creating the enclosure creating the habitat and and going through that whole process so i wonder sometimes if and i i am a huge fan of reptiles but i wonder if if i had just gotten sucked into fish or sucked into some other animal would i just be a fanatic about that because all i'm I'm just using that hobby to access the creative energy that i that i want as a human and i'm not sure if this is really making sense but i i do sometimes wonder if 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 we're addicted to the hobby because of that creative energy that we get from it, or are we, or is it reptiles that come first and then the creativity comes after? I don't know if this is making sense at all. <laughs> no, I think it's totally making sense. Personally, I also, like we were saying earlier, find it therapeutic. It's also almost like an escape, just like most people use TV, social media, movies, and that type of thing as like a getaway type of thing. That's what we find reptiles yeah uh, with and like we get that purpose and enjoyment out of it 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 is weird to explain especially to someone who doesn't also keep animals they're like why would you want to do this but you like honestly you don't even know it's just so amazing and so spectacular spectacular and you really enjoy it it's like i don't know why i enjoy it but i do yeah well that's why I'm never mystified at anybody's hobbies as long as they're not like totally crazy weird hobbies that are dangerous or anything but when someone tells me their hobby is x thing I'm never mystified by it because I know what the feeling it must be to do that so if there's somebody that spends you know 
$30,000 a year building a car engine because they want to have a cool car. I'm not confused by that. I get why they want to go to their garage and tinker with the bolts and, you know, put a, a new turbocharger in or whatever it is they're doing because they get that sort of same meditative feeling that we get for caring for animals. And, you know, I, I think about back when I was a kid and I don't know if you played with Lego. Did you play with, with Lego? Yes, that was my favorite Legos. Yeah. Not dinosaurs, Lego. Me too. So I would spend hours and hours building Lego things, whatever it was. And that feeling that I got as a kid playing with Lego is the same feeling I get now building an enclosure. You know, it's the same thing. The only difference is now it's just in a different medium. Like it's kind of, it's, it's, it's strange. Yeah. It's, it's that shot of dopamine that you get from doing something that you love. And essentially like, where does, where does this purpose come from? Where, or this passion, where does it come from? We don't know, but sticking to your passion is really amazing. And sometimes like getting a new passion comes through the weirdest and strangest things. Like I know personally, I really love building things like snake enclosures now. And you're like, okay, then you get into carpentry. It's yeah. it's weird how things change, but it's it's almost like as humans, we it goes back to that natural like hunter gatherer thing where we want we want that purpose we want not just to be stuck behind our office feel like we're doing crunching numbers useless stuff we want something that means something because that's what our life was created to do we weren't created to just write through down TikTok. numbers and, <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> although you should follow me there that's all <laughs> yeah, i have to follow say Bryce about on that TikTok. yeah yeah <laughs> He's got good videos on TikTok, though. No, but I, I think you're right. I think there is that sort of deeper sense of being a human that, like, taking something from your imagination and then using your hands to create that thing in the oh. reality world or the objective reality, which other, other people can see it, I think is, like, one of the main things that makes us human. And because we're one of, we're maybe one of the only animals that can do that. You know, we can take an idea and turn it into something with our hands. And that process is the most rewarding thing you can do. And I think that's what the hobby is for most people, getting to getting that process out in, in a domain that you like. Like we like reptiles, we like, re- we like animals. So we can access that creative part of our mind, the turning things from our imagination to reality in an area that we are super passionate about. So it's like a, you know, double layering these different, exciting yes. things on top of each other and solving problems also like yes. it's it makes your brain work as humans i think we constantly actually want to learn we want something new we we striving to know more and as know as much as we can and doing stuff like building something working with animals you will fail but every failure is not really a failure because it's a learning curve so did you really fail? Yeah. yeah. You know, that's with the swimmers that I coach. I always talk about that. I always say like, imagine, you know, problem solving is such a huge part of learning as an athlete and becoming better. Imagine if you played a video game where there was literally nothing to do, like no problem solving on the level. Like you would play it for 14 seconds and then you'd throw the disc out the window or delete the game because you, what would you do there? You would just do nothing. So I think you're exactly right. It's that problem solving aspect is a huge part of it. And that's where the creativity comes in because you have to engage in creative, the creative process in order to solve a problem. How am I going to make this enclosure work? How am I going to make the ventilation flow? How am I going to make it so the substrate's deep enough to hold moisture? Those are all different problems that you have to encounter when you work on a project that's related to herpetoculture. Yes. And even for the people that like are extremely logical, it's essentially the same thing. You can use aspects and things in the reptile world can become very logical. Like you can write down the science of checking out these animals. What are they doing here, then and there? Back to record keeping again. That's that's also, yeah, I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so part, part of me thinks about this and thinks, okay, we're using the hobby to allow ourselves to feel this feeling of creativity and solve these problems and I, like I said I think most people do the hobby for that reason and then I you know we, we have a group of people in the hobby who who are stuck in one era of keeping from you know 30 years ago that's you know old school the, the tubs and rack systems and I think if 
I'm guessing they get the same feeling out of the hobby that I do when I build an enclosure. They get that same feeling setting up a rack and going through their Punnett squares to figure out what morph is going to come out of this pairing. And, yes. and so I think maybe if we can encourage those people to, to realize that the creativity and the excitement that you get from the hobby carries over into the way that we care for our animals. The only difference is now the animals at a higher state of welfare. So yes. that must be the right direction to go. Rather, like the feeling that you get as the keeper doesn't change, yes. but the welfare of the animal will change, which ultimately must be the better thing. I think, and that's why most people who have like racks and racks, they are breeders that focus on morphs because you're not getting that same enjoyment out of watching an animal in its enclosure, but you're getting that same enjoyment out of figuring out how to breed them, figuring what morph to pair with what morph equals like what crazy morph type of thing. So exactly. they get the same type of like creative excitement, process. exactly excitement rush that we do, but yeah. in a different way. Exactly. So, as you said, if we can like change that and show you don't even need that many animals, set yeah. up the enclosures and you'll be just as happy, if not happier. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the point that I'm trying to get to is the feeling doesn't change as the keeper. The only thing that's better is the, the higher welfare standard for the animals. And we were talking off air about uh, Chandler, Ch Chandler's wildlife. And the other day, Kenan had posted a video where he was checking out his, his new home and he has this big snake building. And he was looking, I think it was, yeah, it was, he has two big king cobras. I forget how big they are, but they're big. And they're in sort of six foot or eight foot long vision enclosures and they're they're pretty plain and i know he just moved so he, they're not really set up properly but he said you know he's looking at these enclosures and he's just like this is old school keeping this is how i learned to keep 30 years ago this is where or not, not i guess not 30 years ago for him but this is 30 years ago and he's like when i was doing a lot of my hours maybe that was like 10 years ago whatever it was this was the typical setup but he's like this is old school we're ready to move on and he's talking about this massive you know huge enclosure that he's going to build for these two king cobras which will be amazing and but that was just so good to see somebody that's like you know a big name in herpetoculture and he's just all he's doing is saying this is old school this is the way we used to do it it's time to move on yes so so many people will learn from that and see okay chandler's doing this and then they'll actually see like wow chandler set up this in insane walk-in enclosure for his king cobras and look how they are responding differently. Let's let's try make a call now um, on something. So Justina, his female king cobra, she's she's quite feisty. Personally, I believe, depending on how he makes the enclosure, I think she might even calm down in a bigger enclosure with more space to move around. She yeah. might become feistier, but I'm going to call she calms down if he keeps working with her constantly i think she'll calm down with more space and more places to hide because she's less fearful then yeah yeah i agree and he even talked about you know providing you know natural bamboo and, and whatnot to allow her to naturally go through that natural process of creating a nest as she would in the wild and you know some of her cantankerousness if that's a word could come from you know an angst to want to build a nest, for example, or want to do those natural behaviors that she just can't in a plain enclosure. You know, yeah. you can only zip around the enclosure. You're there. It takes you one, two seconds to get from one side to the other. And there's no materials there to build a nest. So I think you're right. If she starts creating a, you know, a small habitat within the enclosure, I think, yeah, she might, her behavior should calm down. Yeah, because, I mean, it's it's proven the range of king cobras in the wild. It's, it's huge. It's absolutely enormous. It's it's huge, yeah. So a walk-in enclosure will essentially be nothing for them, but it it's way, way, way better than like a small vision cage or something like that. And the snakes will start showing insane natural behaviors, which will be even more rewarding to watch. Yeah, and I think that's always one of the you know, venomous snakes probably have the easiest the, the the easiest excuse for keeping in a relatively plain way, right? Because yes. they because it's you know it's maybe it's dangerous to be pulling them out when they can grab onto things and pull you know decor out with them, and it's a bit of a hassle taking them out. So it'd be cool to see someone like Chandler, who's got this huge following, to be working with a species like a king cobra that's you know ten foot or whatever it is huge, putting it in an enclosure like that, and then showing people that it can actually be safely done and it's better for the animal. Yes. Like with me, my enclosures are naturalistic. The only thing that you just got to think about how you design it. 
a lot more than just putting substrate in and a hide. When you're working with the venomous animals, you think about where do I put this water bowl so I can access it and change it easily without disturbing the animal and without getting bitten. Maybe use a naturalistic trap door that I can take out every now and then and clean. But but also, it takes a lot more patience. And yeah. that's where keeping less animals comes in handy because you don't want to be in a rush when you're working with these animals because if you're in a rush, it's like you're in a rush to die. You don't want to mess up. So yeah. take your time and don't be worried that it's taking 10 minutes, half an hour to get a snake out of an enclosure. Exactly, yeah. So I think if we start seeing large venomous collections, and I would say large is anything more than you know 10 or 15 animals because probably one venomous snake is worth like five non-venomous snakes as far as, you know, you know, the stress is concerned, you can call it. But so if we start seeing those larger venomous collections move towards naturalistic care and larger enclosures, I think the rest of the hobby will have to follow along. And in some ways, I think it it would be a little bit embarrassing for some of these clubrid and ball python breeders who are still stuck on that old school keeping to be compared to, you know, somebody that has a venomous collection that's in enclosures that are natural and the animals are doing well you know it's like you guys are so far behind that the people who are working with the actual dangerous animals are above the welfare standards that you have exactly but that i think that also comes to a lot of your venomous species don't do well if you don't set up the enclosure with all the things they need especially like your arboreal vipers and that a lot of them do really really well in nice live planted enclosures if you plant it out and like make it for that exact species so not not putting a generic live planted thing with every single species because some of them yes they may be subtropical but they won't handle it exactly the same like your asian species and your african and different localities too were you going to get some Arboreal vipers, I thought I saw in, you had some little cages, that the little acrylic or glass cages that you had. It looked like maybe arboreal vipers were coming your way. I wasn't sure. Yes. So I'm still busy waiting for them to be born. It's taking like a lot longer this year. It's crazy. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to be getting Atheris squamagera, so your variable bush vipers. And I'm really excited about that because Atheris is another thing that I really want to work towards. And starting with a nice common species that's relatively easy to care for will be nice before you get into some of the rarer animals like your Hispido, which is your hairy bush viper. Mm. I'm sure you've seen a photo. You know that photo that goes online like with the green that, and black. Red, that red snake? Oh. Um, it's like a red red viper with these insane scales. It's I, not I, actually red, but that photo gets edited to all different colors all the oh, time. Okay. I think I've yeah. seen the actual photo because is it an actually a, a green and black snake? Is that what it would naturally be? Well, it can vary, but it's generally like a yellowish green okay, yeah. snake. And yeah. I know, it, yeah, it, it's where the, the the scales are sort of lifted through the back end. Like they sort yes. of curve upwards. Like a mini dragon. Sort of like a mean looking snake. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. They're well, so I think pretty. that'll be awesome. Arboreal vipers are amazing. Do you know how, how many will you get? I'm. I'll probably just get two for now, and okay. then we'll we'll see and go for from there. I'm always busy on enclosures and that because, like, I'm planning on getting animals, but I know it's probably a year or a few months down the line. So it, it takes time to do these things, like. Tomorrow or the day after, I believe, I'm going to be building a nice 1.8 meter enclosure for a very special snake that I'm hoping to get. Doesn't mean I'm going to get it, but either way, I'm going to make a nice naturalistic looking enclosure with live plants in that and a pretty large one. So that's going to be nice. So even it's if a I secret. don't get the snake, you can't tell yes. us what snake it is. No, I can't. Okay. Sorry. You could maybe tell me after. <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see because you had also built those those larger enclosures as well those wooden ones and those are yes. those are still empty right those are ready to go go if you have something come in yes so those are empty but they they're not ready to go yet i'm still wanting to waterproof them i've just not had the finances to waterproof them mm. with like fiberglass and an epoxy resin so it right. can okay. be planted properly and then i'll go on to building out the enclosures way before I get the animals. So, yeah. 
Cool. Well, we'll keep our eyes peeled for a potential new one because that would be kind of cool. Yes, it'll be amazing if 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 it does come true, but we'll see. When would you know if it's going to happen? Uh, in a month or so? No, probably, yeah, maybe in a month or so. I should be, as I have the enclosure set up, I should hear after then, like okay. if it's going to come true. Because initially those 1.5 meter enclosures that I built were for the snake that I'm getting or wanting to get. But I decided let's go bigger, even yeah. though it's not a huge snake. I'm like, I want to give the snake a nice, big, big setup. So then it also doesn't trample all my plants because I'm experiencing a lot of that at the moment. And if it ha- <laughs> yeah. if they have space, they shouldn't destroy it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered a lot. Is there anything else we wanted to uh, to chat about? Um, personally, I don't. I don't remember if i have anything else we had quite a nice discussion of quite a few things yeah i think we're hitting the hour and a half mark and i think if there's anything else we can save it for next time because uh want to save us some save us some ideas for for the next round of the podcast or next round of roast session so yeah no yes. i think this was awesome is, is there anything else you want to wrap up with before before we let them go stay curious and keep keep learning i guess because that's another thing. Always always try find new information and read books. It's actually a good thing. Personally, yes. I'm not I'm not a huge reader, but I'm I'm getting into it. Yeah. I I totally agree. Well, <laughs> I think I can speak for everybody. It's great to have you back. It's great to have you Thank you. to hear your voice again and we're definitely looking forward to the first episode of your podcast being posted again for 2021. And I think for everybody else, thank you guys so much for listening. As always, love chatting with Bryce. I think we covered a bunch of things. So let us know in the comments what you think. I think we touched on some some of those more sketchy areas, so we're happy to hear from the listeners what you guys think as well. So thank you very yes. much. Thank you guys so much for listening and thank you Dylan. This was awesome. Oh yeah, that was great. Thank you.